Thanks, Levi. John. Hey, I got one more praise. We, we, we had so many weeks when Levi was the only kid here in church. And we prayed and started praying and asking God to fill this church with kids again, because it always had been. And, and look at what's going on right now today. And not only are they just kids, they're awesome kids. <laughs> they're awesome kids. I dropped my cane. Jackson just jumped up and grabbed, got, got, grabbed my cane. I mean, we don't just have kids. We got some awesome, awesome, awesome kids. So thank you, Jesus. He does answer prayer. What's that? I don't know. All right, let's grab our bulletins. What's that? Oh yeah. Oh, I thought they I thought they all were ready to go. <laughs> like I say before, that's the best job in the whole church right there, being back there with those kids. Spencer, are you going back there? You're a little bit too old? Alright. Remember you used to go back there, right? <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and grab our bulletin on the front page. I am the resurrection and the life. Boy, I could preach on that today. I am the resurrection and the life. Without the resurrection, there is no life. And then the inside page out of John 3. And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know what? The world can't get that. The world can't get that. So whosoever believeth in him is going to have eternal life. Who believes in him? We are so, we are so blessed that we believe in him. That we believe in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And on the inside. John 3 is one of the greatest, greatest gospel portions of the New Testament. Here we see clearly the eternal truths of the message of Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is of heavenly origin and will be lifted up as one offering for forgiving hope to lost people. Those who place their trust in him gain eternal life and escape eternal judgment, hell. These marvelous truths are encapsulated in the most familiar verse in the New Testament, John 3, 16. There and in the verses that follow, we are reminded of the love and compassion that drove Christ in his redemptive work. And then on the back page, Happy Christmas. Last Easter morning when I walked into church, I saw my friend and greeted her, Happy Christmas. I quickly corrected myself, I mean Happy Easter. Can't have one without the other, she smiled. How true. Without Christmas, there wouldn't be an Easter. And without the resurrection, this day would just be another day. In fact, we wouldn't even be in church. Christmas and Easter are the most joyful celebrations of the year for the Christian. In the first, we celebrate the incarnation, God taking on flesh and coming into the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In the second, we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. He is not here, but he is risen, the angel said. So in the beginning of time, these two days were <laughs> extricably linked to the master plan of the Father. Jesus was born to die for our sins and to conquer death so that we could live, which is more important. Christmas, the birth of infant Jesus, or Easter, the death and resurrection of man, God's Son. Both are essential. And both are clear evidence of the Father's love for us. Happy Christmas and Happy Easter. Jesus, our Savior, left heaven above, coming to earth as a servant with love, laying aside all his glory he came, bringing salvation through faith in his name. And Christmas and Easter, two chapters of the same book. Awesome bulletin.
I do want to start out with a joke. Again, the jokes always have something to do with the message. Sometimes it's pretty obvious. Sometimes you might have to think about it a little bit. But uh, little eight-year-old Susie came to her mom. Said, where did we come from, Mom? And her mom said, God created us. He created everybody. He started with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God created man and woman. God created family. But Mom, little Susie said, Dad said we come from apes. And we evolved over millions of years into human beings. He, he, he said we come from apes. Oh, honey, now you got to understand, your father's talking about his side of the family, and I'm talking about our side of the family. All right. God loves humor. I mean, God, Jesus tells us in John 15 that we should be filled with his joy. We should be filled with his joy. It, it doesn't matter the circumstances. If you see me walking around with these canes, Judy just said, I don't know how you do that. You know how I do it? Because Jesus, because Jesus fills me with this joy. Uh, I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. I, you can't beat that out of me. You can't send enough bad things in my life to steal the joy from me because I know one day for all eternity, I'm going to be with Jesus Christ for all eternity. There's not going to be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow. Oh, just amazing, amazing eternity. Um, one of the things I want to, I think about a lot of things. Uh, if we didn't have a 12 o'clock limit, I would keep going because my mind is just filled with so many things. But one of the things I, I was thinking about this morning as I was praying is uh, for 38 years we celebrated Christmas. We had the manger under the tree. I heard Jesus was the Savior of the world. And then we celebrated Easter. You know, we had the, the, the cross. Uh, we threw the, had the palm trees out there that represented victory when Jesus came into Jerusalem. And uh, the cross, the resurrection, I believed all that. I believed all that. But you know what? I wasn't saved. I wasn't saved. And that's what I want to talk about today. One of God's most important spiritual laws. And it's, it's the law of recognition. It's the law of recognition. What do you recognize? Whatever you recognize is going to determine your life. It's going to determine your destiny. It's going to determine your future. And it's going to determine your future your uh, eternity you think about it satan didn't recognize who god was did he he didn't recognize who he was he thought he could just go ahead and do what he wanted to do he didn't have to listen to him. he didn't have to obey him what about Ju judas judas didn't recognize who jesus was can you imagine walking around with jesus for three years and he didn't recognize who he was the savior of the world the God of the universe was right there with him, walking and talking with him for three years, and he didn't recognize who he was. I think about Eve in the Garden of Eden. She didn't recognize God's holiness. She didn't recognize his holiness. When he commanded her not to eat of the fruit of the tree, she didn't recognize his holiness. She just thought, I'll go ahead and do it anyway. She didn't recognize the, the, the serpent who lied to her and deceived her and got her to disobey God. She didn't recognize that. She didn't recognize sin. And I don't think the world recognizes sin. They don't. That's one of the things. I don't think we recognize sin. I don't think we see it the way God sees it. That's why the world's lost today is because they don't recognize sin. The Bible tells us in Matthew 7 that few people are going to go to heaven and many people are going to go to hell. The wide gate and the narrow gate. Why? Because they don't recognize sin. Not the way God sees it. Think about it. Over one sin, Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden. Over one sin. Sin separates us from God. Over and over and over and over in the Bible, sin separates us from God. Think about David, a man after God's own heart, but yet when he fell into sin, he was separated from God. Read Psalm 51. He said, I, I, I want to come, I want you to come back to me, I'm coming back to you. I stick with Passover. I know everybody wants to call it Easter, that's fine. 
I don't have a problem with that. But actually, we're 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 celebrating Passover. That's the the biblical term of this day that we're we're celebrating today, the Feast of Passover, the Holy Week, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem and presented himself as the Messiah, as the King of Kings, the holiest week in Judaism. It's a remembrance of when God delivered his people from Pharaoh in Egypt. And what does that have to do with us? Today, I hope we're going to put it together today. I know most of us probably know this message. There might be some here that don't. Either way, this is the message the Lord put in my heart. It's here for somebody. Somebody needs to hear this today. Because God knows better than me what you guys need to hear. I don't. Remember, God's people, everybody's seen the Ten Commandments with uh, Yule Brenner and Charlton Heston? The people of Israel were, were slaves to Egypt for 400 years. The people cried to God to deliver them. God sent Moses to deliver his people out of Egypt. God sent nine plagues to Egypt because Pharaoh wouldn't let his people go. Pharaoh kept, kept saying, no, I'm not letting you go. I'm not going to obey God. I'm not going to do what God says to do. So God sent, he had to send plague after plague after plague. He turned the water into blood. He made it all dark. He sent the plague of locusts, the frogs, the lice. The flies, the plague of boils. He said nine plagues and Pharaoh still refused to recognize who God was. And finally, God said, okay, one more. You, you haven't recognized who I am after I've done these nine plagues on you. Can you imagine not recognizing who God was? If I was Pharaoh and I saw all these plagues come on my land, the, all the water in Egypt turned to blood? That, I would only need one play to get me to realize I'm messing with a God. Maybe the, the mightiest God, because they had hundreds of gods. And in darkness over the whole land, you couldn't even light a light. You couldn't get no light. It was pitch dark. We, we've never seen pitch dark, probably. There's always some kind of light, either you know, a street light or the moon or something. God made it pitch dark where you couldn't even see your hand from. And then he sent the plague, the locusts came in, all, ate all the, the crops, and you had the, the flies. Can you imagine being in your house with a thousand flies in the room you're in? Plague after plague after plague. Lice, boils, boils from the top of your head to the body. Can you imagine? I, I hear they're painful. I've never had one. I heard one is painful. God sent boils. Can you imagine them still saying, I, I don't recognize, I don't, who are you? I don't know who you are. You, I, you, don't, you, don't, you don't mean nothing to me after seeing that and all that. So God, let's, let's turn to Exodus chapter 12. So God finally said, you know, enough's enough. Enough's enough. That's the kind of God he is. But in Exodus chapter 12, Verse 23, we're going to see the first Passover. And a lot of people say, oh, hey, I've heard of Passover, it's a Jewish holiday. No, it's not a Jewish holiday. It's, it's a Christian, it's a Christian thing. Because it's about Jesus Christ. If you think it's just Jewish, then, then you missed it. You missed it, because it has to do with us. Passover is a, is a deliverance of Jesus Christ from his people from Pharaoh and Egypt, which is a deliverance from Satan, and, and he did the same for us. But look at verse 23, Exodus 12, 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood upon the lintel on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your house and to smite you. So here's what God said. You take a lamb and you watch him for four days. And if he's pure, then you, you sacrifice and you kill him and you put the blood on the top of the door and the two sides, three. God's number is always three. There's a reason he does three all the time. He wants to prove that he's a triune God. We're not going to get in that today. I just want to throw that out there for you. And God said when the destroyer comes and your firstborn is going to die, he's going to kill your firstborn. And if he sees that blood on your doorpost, he'll pass over your house. He will not. Lose your firstborn son. You will be uh, spared the judgment of God. The judgment of God. 
Well, guess what? Pharaoh and the Egyptians just blew God off. Just blew God off. It's like sometimes when I talk to people and I tell them about the blood of Jesus Christ, they blow me off. They go, oh, I'm a good person. Oh, I'm all right. Don't You don't need to tell me about that. You know, they, 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 People will just blow you off. They blew off God, didn't they? They blew off Moses. Judas blew off Jesus. And if you try to go out and witness to people, you know they do. You know they do. They don't want to hear it. And then if we jump down to verse 29. And it came to pass. That means God. what God says is going to happen. What God says is going to happen. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt and the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne under the firstborn of the captives that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. God's word was true. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. That's the Passover. That's what we're celebrating today. The Passover. The Jews trusted in the blood of the Lamb to save them from God's judgment. The Egyptians didn't. And God's judgment fell on them. The Bible said you could hear a cry all through Egypt. Can you imagine losing your firstborn child, your firstborn son? Why? Because they didn't recognize who God was. They didn't recognize what God said. They didn't recognize God's man, Moses. They didn't recognize who they were messing with. We are so blessed that we recognize who Jesus Christ is. Like I said, I had religion for 38 years and I did not recognize who he was. I knew all these things about him, but I never recognized who he was. I never recognized. The Jews are rejoicing because God freed them from Egypt because they recognized what he said. He said the blood, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb will save you from my judgment. So what's that have to do with us? You know, we're not Jews. Most of us don't celebrate a Passover like the Jews do. They have the Passover Seder. They got the cups. They got the bread. They got, they got a whole ritual there. We, we, we don't do that. We don't do that. But it does have to do with us. Look at John. Let's go to John chapter 1 verse 29. And a lot of people think, you know, the Old Testament isn't for Christians. The Old Testament is about the Jews. It is about the Jews, but it's, it's also about God and his people. And, and uh, it's about us. Because now we're in the New Testament. And we look at John, John the Baptist, who God sent to prepare the way for Jesus. And if we look at John 1, verse 29, it says, The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Wow. Wow. What a statement. What a statement. The world doesn't get it. They don't see it. They don't understand it. We are so blessed. We are so blessed. Lisa came to church, got saved after one day. Marissa came, got saved after one day. She heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and got saved. This is what it's all about. The lamb that Moses had killed represents Jesus on the cross. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Just like they had to apply the lamb in Moses' day and had to kill the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost to ex escape God's judgment. We, Jesus got to be our lamb. The guy's singing about the heart, the blood of Jesus. The heart of, when God, when we offer the blood of Jesus to to God, he, he forgives us of all our sins. When he sees the blood of Jesus, he will pass over us. We will not see death and we will not see judgment. God's judgment will not come on us. I like to break things down so we can see and understand it better. Because 
A lot of people say, oh, I know, I know. Well, no, maybe, maybe you do. Maybe you don't. And this is what the lost people or the lost souls can't understand. They can't get this, okay? They can't get it. And, and, and that's why they don't come to Jesus and ask for salvation. That's why they're not going to heaven, because they can't get this. Look at this. Let's go to Romans chapter 6, Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 6. If we understand what's going on, even if you're saved, this is good for you that maybe you're going to be able to witness to maybe a family member or a friend that's not saved, and it, it will give you some ammunition. But if you take them to John 6, or, or, or Romans chapter 6, because if, if they don't get this, if they don't recognize this, I, they're not probably going to get saved. They probably won't. Because if they don't recognize this, this is the key point right here. In Romans chapter 6, verse 20, 23, God says, the Apostle Paul says that God says, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The wages, that's something you earn, right? This is what you earn because of your sin. Death. And if you want to read and study the Bible out, it's not a physical death, it's a spiritual death. It's separation from God. When God told Adam and Eve, if you eat the fruit of that tree, you're, that, in that day you're going to die, right? Did they die physically? No. God kicked them out of the Garden of Eden. They were separated from God. Death in the Bible always, re well, it represents dying physically, but it, most of the time it represents being separated from God. And when you're separated from God in all eternity, you go look in the book of Revelation, it's called the second death, when God sends people to hell. And here's what they don't understand. That they deserve to go to hell because of their sin. They don't understand that. They don't understand it. Jim, he, he, he could almost get there by himself. But that one time he lied at work, that he punched in at, on time and he didn't. That, that's going to send him to hell. We don't understand that. We don't, we don't want to hear it. I'm a good person. You know what? Try that. Try that in the, in the jury system we got. Try that. Go to court. Go to court. When you, when you were driving drunk and you killed somebody... Is you drive drunk and you go to the judge and say, hey, you know what? I, I, this is the first time I ever dro drove drunk for 40 years. I drove sober. What's he going to say? Okay, just go ahead and go home. The wages of sin is death. It's separation from God. Separation from God. I talk to people. I've talked to thousands of people. I've been saved 29 years to talk to thousands of people. And 90% of them believe the lie of Satan. They're going to believe the lie of Satan. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. And, you know, by man's standards, yeah, you're a good person. But by God's standards, you're not. You're not. We here at the house of the Lord, we, we recognize that we need a Savior. We need a savior. We, 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 none of us are, are foolish enough to think that we can get there without Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am the way. There is no other way. He's the only way. And if you don't go through Jesus, Jesus said, no one comes unto the Father except by me. But let's see what God says, okay? Let's find out what God says. Because what I say really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's what God says that matters. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. We're in Romans. All we got to do is jump, jump back a couple of pages. Romans chapter 3. Have you ever read Romans chapter 3? The Jews are talking bad about the Gentiles here. The Jews say, oh, we're children of God and they're, they're not. You know, we're, we're God's people and they're not. But look what, what Paul says God says in verse 9. Romans 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? He's, Paul's saying, are we, are we, are Jews? Are we better than the Gentiles? He says, no, and no wise. For we have before proved both Jew and Gentiles that they are all under sin. We're all sinners. And then look what God says. 
There is none righteous, no, not one. Oh, yeah, you're a good person? No, you're not. No, you're not. You're looking at a standard right here. You're not looking and you don't recognize the holiness of God. Because God's not going to accept sin. He's a holy God. When Jesus was on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did forsake him. He turned his back on Jesus. He was separated from Jesus Christ because he took on sin of the world. Sin's not going to be in heaven. Jim, I'm sorry that one day you punched in and said, it was, that's, that's going to keep you out. It's going to keep you out. Look what God says. There's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that understand. There's none that seek us after God. We've all gone out of the way. We've all done our own thing. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. There's not, God says there's not one that does good. So now tell me you're a good person. Well, you got a problem with God. Because God said there's not one that's good. No one. God tells us that all of our righteousness, the best we can be, is like filthy rags. You're kind of judging yourself, you know, by Chris, Zach, Bella. When, we're not, when we get judged, we're getting judged by the holiness of God. That, you're, that ain't going to, that ain't going to, it ain't going to cut it. I love the Oak Ridge boys. We went and seen them down in Branson. They're, they got some good testimonies. They were some crazy guys that got saved. Much like many of the people in this church, like me. There's a few other. But one of their songs says, The first step to heaven is knowing you're lost. The first step to heaven is knowing you're lost. Do you realize that, that you're, you're separated from God? Do you realize that your sin has separated you from God? The first step to heaven is knowing you're lost. Because if you don't believe you're lost, you're going to remain lost. You know, it, it's easier to lead somebody to the Lord who's had a, a very wicked life. Did you know that? Than to somebody who's been a pretty good person their whole life. Because the wicked guy's going to say, you know what, I got no chance to get to heaven. All the dumb stuff I've done, I got no chance to get to heaven. I need, I need a Savior. But the good person is going to say, hey, I'm a pretty good person. I'm going to be all right. God will take care of me. I'll, he, I'll get there. That's just a lie straight from hell. And Satan's filling up hell every day because people believe that lie. What's the cross all about? You say you believe in Jesus. No, you don't. No, you don't. If you've never asked him to save you, you don't believe in him. You don't believe who he is. He only came for one reason. When, when, when he was born, they said, he's the Savior. He's the Savior. I knew he was the Savior for 38 years, but he wasn't my Savior. It don't do no good to know about Jesus. It does no good to know about you. There's a lot of people going to go to heaven and they're going to get in and stand before Jesus on Judgment Day. It don't do no good to know about Jesus. You better know him. <laughs> you better know him. Can you imagine? God told the Jews, I want you to kill the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost, all right? Can you imagine, if, you know, you're sitting there. Say you were back there in Jesus' time and you said, you know what? I ain't gonna believe in that blood stuff. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna nail up my church membership on the doorpost. And your neighbor goes, hey, yeah, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a list of all my good deeds and nail them up on the doorpost. And the other guy said, hey, you know, I got, I got my Father of the Year certificate. I'm going to nail that up on the doorpost. The other guy said, hey, you know what? I'm going to nail up all the money I gave you the church. I'm going to nail that up on the doorpost. And the other guy said, hey, you know, that's a good idea. You know, I pray a lot. I'm going to put all the hours I pray and nail it up on the doorpost. You know what's going to happen to those people? God's judgment's going to come down on them. Because he didn't say, put your church membership on the doorpost. He didn't say, put all your good deeds on the doorpost. He didn't say, put your father year, good, year certificate on the doorpost. 
He didn't say how, how much money you gave, put it on the doorpost. He didn't say, tell me about all the hours you pray. He didn't say put that. He said put the blood of Jesus on the doorpost. Because that's the only thing that's going to matter. It's the only thing that's going to matter. I, my heart breaks. Man, I got family members. I got big families on both sides and hardly none of them are saved. Oh, I'm all right. I got my religion. I'm a good person. I do this. I do that. I do that. I do that. I don't need the blood of Jesus. And when they're going to stand before Jesus one day, they're going to find out they're not going to get into heaven. Because they're the only one way to get in. And that's God's way. And that's through the blood of the Lamb. There's no other way. Friday night, we were watching Passion of the Christ. How many have seen Passion of the Christ? If you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. Young kids, it's not for young kids. It's very, very brutal. It's the best movie I've ever seen. Uh, very, very brutal. Young kids, if you're parents, probably don't really want them watch it. <sighs> but, uh, it's rated R because it's so brutal. And it shows Jesus getting beat and whipped. Just It's a bloody mess. They they tie him up. They chain him up on a Roman post there. And then they just start whipping and beating. They take a, a Roman scourge. The guy s smashes it into the, the, wooden, the wooden table. And it just, just catches and pulls the wood out. Very, very brutal. What was going on there? What was going on there? What? A lot of people have no idea what the cross was all about. What's the cross about? What's the cross about? Do we know? What was Jesus doing? Why did, why did Jesus have to go to the cross? We got a picture in our hallway. It's pretty cool. It's, it's a picture of a, a wood and three nails. And, and, and it says, God says, the Father says, Son, I want you to go build a bridge. And all you need is some wood and three nails. God, Jesus is building the bridge to heaven right here. Jesus is building the bridge to heaven. And if you don't go, go across on Jesus' bridge, there's no other bridge to heaven. There's no other bridge to heaven. There's only one bridge, and that's Jesus. He's the only bridge. My heart breaks. I tell people and tell people and tell people, and very, very few people, very few people get saved. There's only one bridge. You can't get to heaven any other way. The bridge you think is going to get you there is, is going to go straight down to hell. If you think there's another bridge to go there, it, 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 Satan has lied to you and deceived you. You haven't seen what God has said and, and you're not following what God said to do. And then you say you believe in Jesus. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't believe you're a sinner that deserves to go to hell. Because that's what God said. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that do with good. You don't believe that. You still believe I'm a good person. Or you still believe my religion is going to get me there. Or this is going to get me, or that's going to, there's only one way to get there, and that's the, that's the bridge that Jesus has built. I like that old song. What can wash away my sins? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You got a sin problem with God. I don't care who you are, Jim, you're one sin. You got a sin problem with God. And if God doesn't take care of that sin problem, you ain't getting in. You ain't getting in. I don't care what you think, you ain't getting in. But fortunately, God loves us enough that he built that bridge. He sent Jesus to build that bridge. I thought I was thinking about something pretty cool. Why does red represent blood? You ever think about it? I think crazy stuff all the time. Why does red represent blood? You know, somebody gets hurt or cut or shot and you see blood, you would think red ought to represent pain, don't you think? Whenever you see somebody hurting or in an accident, you see all that blood. But it doesn't. It represents love. Why? Because of Jesus on the cross. You think about it. Why does red represent 
Go, to, go on Valentine's Day. Where do you see? Red, 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 red. Why? Because it represents love. And the only reason it represents love is because it represents Jesus on the cross. There's no greater love than he would give up his life for his friends. He died on the cross for you. He loved you so much that he came down from heaven, went through all this for you so that you could get to heaven. He paid for your sins on the cross. He didn't have any sins. The only thing God ever paid for in all eternity was your sins. He never had to pay for anything else, and he never will have to pay for anything else. The only thing he's ever paid for in all eternity is your sins and my sins. He paid for them so that we could get to heaven. And a lot of people hear that and they say, well, everybody's going to heaven. No, it isn't. No, no, they're not. He said, only those who believe in him. Do you believe he paid for your sins? Do you believe he's the only way to heaven? Do you believe you've got to ask him to save you? It's, it's, you know, sometimes God is so simple, you think, man, how can anybody miss it? But they do. How come my mom and my brother and his two boys got saved? after about four or five weeks. And my dad, 11 months, and he still wasn't saved. Why? Why? I mean, my dad's just as smart as they are, maybe maybe even smarter. Don't have nothing to do about being smart. It has to do with what you believe. It has to do with what you believe. I, I, I know. <laughs> I know Jesus paid for my sins. I believe it because God said it. I believe it. I believe that he loves me because nobody's ever done nothing like that for me. Nobody's ever taken the beating that he took, the crucifixion he took for me to pay for my sins. We are so blessed. I, I tell people all the time, I love the verse, Blessed are your eyes, for they see. And blessed are your ears, for they hear. Because the, the world don't get it. They don't see. I don't see why I have to ask Jesus to save me. You don't get it. How are you getting to heaven then? If you're getting to heaven and you don't need Jesus, God really must have messed up because he didn't need to send Jesus to, to go to the cross and get beaten and whipped and, and crucified. He must have messed up if we can get there some other way. Somebody, somebody ain't figuring it out here. Somebody don't recognize what the heck's going on here. I'm glad it's not me. <laughs> I'm glad it's not me. 29 years ago, I was told, if you want to get to heaven, you've got to ask Jesus to save you. You know, I was a pretty wild, crazy guy when I was younger. Just crazy, crazy. I wasn't afraid of anything except going to hell. Only thing that scared me. Only thing that scared me. Because I didn't know where I was going. Because I used to think, man, you know... I'm not that bad, but I'm not that good either. You know, I don't know where I'm going. It's the only thing that scared me. You know, I really wasn't afraid to die because all the stupid stuff I did, I, you know. Shoot, I remember one night, me and Kevin were, were flying home from the bar one night. I was going probably 95, 100, and he flew back, back on his motorcycle like I was standing still. And we were both... <laughs> out drinking all night and I said how many times did God save save me from death I could have been in hell for all eternity for some reason you know the nights I didn't even know how I got home last thing I woke up on my floor in my room in my living room and last thing I remember I was doing shots at the bar I don't even know how I got home some God you know man there's, there's no reason, I, there's, there's, the only reason I'm not in hell and not being in hell or going to hell for all eternity is because what Jesus did on the cross. It's the only way. That's the only way. I, 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 I can't explain it anymore. Most of us here know it. Most of us here are saved. 
But you know what? I hope what you get out of this, if, if you're saved, is how grateful that we should be to Jesus Christ for what He did. Because He did it for you. Take it personally. Go watch the Passion. He did that for you. He did it so that you could be with Him for all eternity. When He put His arms out like that, He was giving us an invitation. Come on. Come on. Come to me. Come to me. I'll give you eternal life. Come to me. One of the saddest verses in the whole Bible that Jesus says, and they won't come to me that they might have eternal life. They won't come to me. They won't come to me. Wow. Wow. What if you had stage four cancer? I'm going to give you one more analogy because I love giving analogies. What if you had stage four cancer and the doctor said, this cancer is not going to really kill you right away. It's going to last about 10, 20 years, and you're going to be in so much pain that the, the most of the morphine they give you is not even going to work. You're just going to be in pain for 10, 20 years. He said, but you know what? There's, there's hope. I got this pill right here. This pill takes care of that. And, and you take this pill, and by tomorrow you'll be healthy, and there will be no more pain, no more cancer. And you say, ah, let me think about that. Let me think. I don't want to get that. I'm not... The doctor said your, your your insurance will pay for that pill. It's free. It's free. Yeah, I don't think I want it. I think I I think I, I nah I I don't want it. See you, doc. What would you call that man? I got a lot of names I can't say here at church, but that's what Jesus says. Come to me. Come on. Come on. Ask me to save you. And I'll save you. And I'll give you eternal life. And people say no. People say no. One day, there's going to be thousands of people in hell for all eternity. And they're going to be thinking about me. You know, Bill Sandoval, he tried to tell me about Jesus. He tried to tell me I needed to ask him to save me. He tried to tell me how he got eternal life and how I can have eternal life. He, he loved me enough to come and tell me. He loved me enough to, to make an appointment to take me out to dinner and tell me. Or he loved me enough to come to my house and tell me. He loved me enough to stop me in the store and tell me about Jesus. I wish I would have listened to him. Because I'm in hell for all eternity and I can't get out. We shall listen. Let's bow our heads. Holy Father, mighty God, we thank you so much, Lord, for all you've done and blessed us with, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you've opened up our eyes, that we can see your great salvation. We can see the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who suffered on the cross and paid for our sins so that we could have eternal life. That all you've done, all that you've done for us, and all you say is just trust me. Trust me to save you. Trust me to forgive your sins. Trust me to give you eternal life. Believe in me that I will do that for you. So simple of a commandment. Paul says in 10, 13, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Like the guy on the cross. Two guys on the cross, both of them deserved to be crucified, and one said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He just trusted Jesus Christ to save him, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in eternity. We all have loved ones and friends and family. Lord, I pray you open up their eyes, that they can see what we see, that we can understand what we understand, that there's no other way to get there except by you and by the blood of the Lamb. Father, we pray that you allow us to be witnesses, to go out and preach your gospel as you commanded us, so that they might be saved too. And Lord, just uh, continue to be with us in this church as we go out and spread your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Missy, Patty, Leslie, you're going to have to... Who's singing? Oh, shoot. Well, we got more stuff to do. Man, I'm glad... I'm telling you, pray for, hey, pray for my brain. Pray for my brain. Let's go ahead and we'll take the love offering first. We do this three times a year. 
we help out the people in our church that, that need a little bit of help financially. We do that three times a year. Uh, you want to bless the offering? Amen. Jesus tells us, whatever we do for the least of your brothers, you do it unto me. And that's just the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Levi. John. Hey, Levi, you gotta stay up here. All right, we're gonna we're gonna take the Lord's Supper at this time too. Um, if you want to follow along, it's in First Corinthians chapter eleven when Jesus at the Last Supper, and he told uh, his disciples. Uh, Paul said, "For I received of the Lord, which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread." And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And this, remembering him going to the cross and his, and his love and his salvation for us. You want to bless the bread? Amen. We got it in bags, so one bag should take care of a family. There's enough pieces in there. And as we eat the bread, notice it's broken, notice the holes in it, represents Jesus' broken body on the cross, the holes from the nails. And if you took the whole piece of bread, you could see the stripes on it. Hebrew, Hebrew matzah. As we drink, eat the bread, let's remember his broken body that he put on the cross to take care of us for all eternity. Verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. And he's coming soon. You want to bless the cup? Amen. Thanks, Tom.
Alright, as we drink the cup, the juice represents the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for our sins. Would you bless the cup? Amen. Holy Father, mighty God, we thank you so much, Lord, that, that you would come down, that you would send your son to build that bridge to heaven. A bridge we can't build. And no other bridge can get there, Lord. Only through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can we come to you. We thank you, Lord, that you made a way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You going to sing, Miss? Thank you. <laughs> Two eighty two, family of God. I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. All right, have a great Passover. <laughs>